Hi there. My name's Nicholas Tarrison, and I was in London's Burning, where I'm most known for playing the part of Les Taylor, who was George the Fireman's brother-in-law. And then after a suitable gap, I returned for one episode to play a paramedic. Well, this is a little story in itself, but in a sense, I feel it highlights what the situation was like back in the day and just gives people who are not involved in film and TV what the process actually can be. Because nowadays you see all the talent shows on the telly and it leads into this and it leads to that, but real life for most of us isn't like that. So to keep it as potted as possible, I left drama school associated with an agent but not actually on her books. She recommended a photograph, which was of a nice smiling me, because I've got a lovely smile. But when I walk into a room, that's not what people tend to react to. <laughs> so I'd saved up all the money I could get. I was on the dole. It was before computers, so you had to typewrite letters. I saved up money for stamps, because you had to do a stamp address envelope. And I sent off 100 letters, 25 replies, six auditions, including two or three children's theatre, and I got nothing. I was on the dole for two years in London, just trying, because if, if you haven't got an agent, if you haven't got work, you can't get an agent. And if you haven't got an agent, you can't get work. Plus, we're talking in the mid 80s, you had to have an equity card to get a job. If you didn't have an equity card, you couldn't get work. So again, another catch 22. So finally, a mate wound me up and said, you're always telling jokes, do stand up comedy. I thought, okay, game on. He left, within half an hour I got an act, marketed that and it worked. I did eight performances in 1985 as major KGB. The ranks that likes to see, yet. A mate who had been at Guildford and was BBC armourer, Ken Bond, supplied me with a full Russian uniform, complete with Walther PPK, a semi-automatic pistol, which one could walk around the streets in those days and not get arrested, which was funny. And I got the card. Getting the card was important because of two things. One, I could join the Actors Centre. And I joined the fencing club where having won the stage fighting prize at college, it progressed my stage fighting and by learning how to fence properly. And I got to meet Bill Hobbs, fight director. And it got me into the Royal Opera House Covent Garden where I worked for 14 years on and off in live productions. The second thing it gave me was I could start work. Now, I want you to get to West End, but back in the day, you had to have 30 weeks work to get your full equity card. And you could either get into a show, but reps by that time were just, they were disappearing rapidly. The heyday had been in the 50s and into the 60s, and you hear so many stories from actors of that generation who had worked with someone in rep and they'd been discovered and directors had gone to see. That, that had practically gone. I mean, it was really getting to the age when casting directors didn't even leave the office. It was a real transitional phase. So out of the blue, having no agent, but with my equity card, I got asked to audition for Crime Watch, BBC. And I landed this role. At the time, I was associated with the comic book shop, Eternal Comics in London, where I used to hang out and serve and got into that world and I was being offered the manager's job so instead I went off and did this job two days I got 186 quid which back in then was like what that's it so the chap who I work with on this job said well why don't you do walk-on work he said there is a risk 
because British casting directors and directors were very, oh, that's what you do. You're a noddy. But it will get you to understand how to work on camera. I thought, well, I was a natural. I knew I was a natural anyway that I could do. I wasn't faced by having a camera on me. But it's the whole thing of being on the set, set etiquette, how to do it, and also networking. So I signed up for three agencies. I have a Kimmel agency, the Ugly agency, and Bother Boots. And that covered a lot of bases. And I started getting work. And I'd go up and I'd say, hi there, my name's Nicholas Harrison. I'm one of the Walcons. Here's my CV. I'm an actor. I'm learning. I thought, well, I've got nothing to lose. And because I could do the work and do it well, most of the time, I wasn't one of those stuck at the back of the camera. I got pulled to the front. And to be honest, some of the work would have been your actual C-list acting role two or three lines because sometimes I'd ad lib and because I was on it, it was sharp. They kept it in and just paid you as a walk on too. So you got an extra tenner for it. And I became one of the regular background coppers on the bill. Now the bill was an important program at the time because they had such churn. They used so many people, but equally they had a sign on their door, the casting department saying, we will cast you for a role, even if you're a walk-on. And that was so heartening to know that I could be that close. And this is where the actor centre and the stage fighting kick in. Because of working so many performers and working at the Opera House, it then changes how you view films and TV and, you, and theatre. And you realise that one of the problems is, and I think it still is to an extent, that how a person looks and acts is one of the key things that a director and the casting director look for. But when the role calls for fighting to be involved, that, that's, that's an afterthought. I mean, the number of times somebody turns up they're perfect for the role. And the director says, right, can you fight? And you get some pile of rubbish on the box or on a film or in the theatre because they can't do it. So talking amongst all the guys and the girls, because especially for the young, we had a couple of female fencers who wanted to be fighter rangers, but they also wanted to act. And it was to push that out there that I devised that we would, we could produce a stage fighting list where every name on there you would know could fight unarmed blades you name it we could do it and therefore it was up to the casting director and director to look at them and go look at us and go that's who i want because you look right for the job and i know you can fight and the Actors Centre happened to have a question and answer session with Julian Oldfield, who was one of the casting directors from the bill. And I sat through the first half and at the interval, I went up to him and I said exactly what I've just said to you. Would he be interested in a list of fighting actors? He said, well, what's the point? I said, well, the point is you look for the face. And you would know that everyone on there can do whatever skill that they say they can. And that was that. Now, I still hadn't got an agent at this point. And then I get this phone call saying, would you come down and audition for the bill? Wow. Because the part, the character in it has got to take a punch. Yes. So I went down, met Julian, and the director was the late Gordon Fleming, who is Jason Fleming's late father. We discussed it. I got the job. The episode aired in July 1990, 
just before the World Cup, and it was inspired by a bust up which had happened at Plough Lane between Justin Fashionu and Viv Anderson between Wimbledon and Man United, and it occurred in the tunnel. So that's what happened. I played a goalkeeper, gets into an argument with the oppo centre forward, he punches me out, breaks my jaw. So not only did I get to film in the tunnel where the incident happened, the physio who was there when the actual incident had happened originally, she was there. I got to sit in the chair where it all happened and do broken jaw acting, which was quite fun because the guy who was playing the doctor kept looking at me going, are you all right? So I was sitting there going... <laughs> Now, all of that preamble all comes together when, within six months, I get another call saying, would you come down to London's Burning? You're being considered for a part, which will film over two episodes. And you've got to audition for both directors separately. I think, great, not just one audition, I've got to do two. So I went down and we ch we're chatting, what have you done? And this is where the walk-on work had actually paid dividends. First of all, I said, I've worked on the bill. I had a part on the bill or I had a fight. Brilliant. You can work under pressure. Because back in the day, the thing that the Bill and London's Burning had in common, and for the London's Burning, it lasted up until season 12, was they were shot in a single camera. What that usually meant, especially if John Reardon was directing, was you would have the master shot, where you would have, say, the two performers in. Then you would do... A close up two shot, you do a reverse, then the reverse, that's it. So you had, after the master shot, you had three shots where you could cut from. That's what the bill used, that's what London's Burning used. And there's no messing around, there's no at alls. Both shows were very almost working class and very natural. And if you hadn't got that style, and couldn't cope with that, you didn't get on. So that was in my favour. Then I said, um, I worked with Al Clark because I'd been one of those roles that I'd said in the walk on work where you get pushed to the front, but they pay you as cheaply as possible, but you're doing stuff which a paid actor would have done. And I did three to four days on Alan Clark's film, The Firm with Gary Oldman and Phil Davis about football hooligans. I was one of Yeti's gang. And so I got to do all the stage fighting in that, baseball bats and punch-ups in the Tower Hotel, cracking stuff. And Al Clark had recently passed away and both directors went, oh, Al Clark, wonderful fella. But I'd proven myself and so... I got the job. The paramedic role was a surprise. When I was on the bill, because of the high churn in episodes, there was equally high churn in actors. You could almost guarantee that if you'd kept your nose clean and done a good enough job, wait enough years and you'll come back on. And I ended up with three different appearances on the bill, all of which involved <laughs> fighting. So I've got a skill, I can use it. With London's Burning playing Les over two series, I thought that was it. And then five years later or so, I get a call from my then agent for a different casting company, Crocodile Casting, um, wanted me to interview for the role of the paramedic. 
they'd obviously forgotten about me as Les. So I turned up, got the job, turned up on set, and most of the crew were still there. So I spent lovely time sitting there, chatting away with Glenn Murphy. Sound guy was still there. It, it felt still like part of a family. And it was also a significant moment for a number of reasons between what had happened between series seven and series 13. Up until series 12, as I said, London's burning like the bill was a single camera. Series 13 was different because when we went to film, we filmed in Woolwich Arsenal before the redevelopment. It was about an aeroplane crash. And I turned up to help look at, see if there were any survivors. It was directed by Susan Tully, who had not long left EastEnders. And it was filmed on two Steadicams. Now, each take, again, there's always a time pressure on the bill and London's burning. And the most takes that you had were two takes per shot. And out of those two takes, you'd have four camera shots and you'd have two vocal tracks. And within that, they would edit. But the problem with that particular episode was it marked the end of an era. And to anyone who grew up watching the Sweeney and the hour episodes of The Bill, ITV shows were 53 minutes long from the opening credits to the closing credits. And they had two ad breaks. If one's read any of the Sweeney biographies, the production crew referred to them as Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. And they were written specifically so that you would have a climax towards the end when you were coming up to an ad break. Everything was timed. I happen to know the writer of the episode that I was in with the, as the paramedic. And literally two days before filming, he gets told by the producer, we're switching to three ad breaks. And the result was it totally blew up for where he'd written for three. He suddenly had to write for four. And then the producer had a fiddle with the script as well. And the director and stuff got taken out of context. And the result was, from a technical viewpoint, it was one of the most difficult to do because we'd lost the flow. And as an actor, you get into it, you get your role, you're away from the cast and crew, you try and learn your lines. You've got no, even if you've got someone who's holding the script in front of you, you don't know how it's going to play out. You just run the words through and you hope it sticks. And that when you turn up, you grab someone and you run through your lines. Now this one was having problems sticking and I'm getting really worried and I think, oh my God, maybe I'm losing the knack. Turn up on set and all the actors are standing there going through exactly the same thing, just trying to find, make it stick because it had been broken. And there's also, there's a lot of, I mean, my dialogue in there, were, I was talking over the top of conversations. I was talking directly to someone, are you all right? And meanwhile, there's banter going back and forth, and that's not related to what I'm saying. So technically, it was as more difficult than anything I've done before is Les, but, you know, it's something different. He's a lovely fella. Really got on well with Glenn. Um, Glenn wasn't an actor beforehand. And the story he told me, and I hope he doesn't mind me sharing, was on the pilot episode of London's Burning, the, his role was played by Ray Winston. 
and he was Ray. He, Ray was his mate. So we used to turn up on set and sit there and watch him. And I go, who's that? Ah, oh, it's Ray's mate. And then when they got the go-ahead to do the series, Ray Winston was unavailable. I went, oh, gosh, who should we use? I went, how about Ray's mate? Glenn got the job. So by the time we come to episode four, he's well into it and he is part of the furniture. I get in with Neil, who plays Denzel. We are the brothers. And has anyone seen the wedding sequence? Yeah, we cause trouble. So we shot, and this was quite bizarre, we shot the ending first. We had four scenes and we shot backwards. And so we ended up with the sequence where they're sitting at the table, the brothers are drunk, we have an argument with the best man and I pick him up and I shove him in the wedding presents. Then Glenn comes running down the room, bangs our heads together, that punches me out. So that's good. So we do all the setup, that's fine. And down he comes and we've choreographed it. And what John Redden, the director, wants is he wants a right hand. So he does the right hand. As an actor, you react to it, bosh. It sells, it works. Take two. Try it again. And I think it was the third take, could have been the fourth, when Glenn is into it. Now, what you might not know is that Glenn had been an amateur boxer and he was in the zone so he comes running down and i'm ready and he throws a left because that's what right-handed boxers tend to do you step with the left punch with the right and he connected <laughs> bang i go down cut producer comes over are you all right as I heard it, meaning, do you still want to work for London's Burning? To which I replied, yes, I am all right. As I said, as we shot in reverse order, they put makeup on for the final scene where I got a mark on there. So they had to damp it down. I got an ice cube on and that. And it was fine. It was just a bit of a split. And it was all good. It was so apologetic. Yes, you know, it happens. Then when it was released, my wife got told by a colleague at school, that she's a teacher, um, have a look at the Daily Star. So I went out to get a copy of the Daily Star. And I was like on page three, something like that. A headline. Nick. Cocky Nick Knocked Spark Out by Gary Bushell. And this puff piece which said, yeah, and he's a bit cocky and uh, stuck him off. I was absolutely devastated because, I mean, this is London's Burning we're talking about. This is my second major TV role. And I've been described in the press as being cocky. I thought that could shoot my reputation down, my chance of work full stop. So I rang Spotlight and asked to speak for Glenn Murphy's agent, spoke to them, and he called me back. And he said, yeah, he said, you know, he said, I'm devastated. He said, I thought we got on so well. I said, mate, we did. No problems for you at all. And he said, you know what? He said, we've been stitched up. He said, between the old WT publicity department and Gary Bushell, he said, they're obviously feeding them bullshit to crank up and he said I'm, get, I'm getting all sorts of shit from them my wife was grabbed outside of premiere and he said she said something like um you know occasionally he comes home late they did that as a full story of 
my dinners get ruined because Glenn comes home late. And he said, I'm taking legal action on it. Whether it happened or not, I don't know, but I never appeared in the press again and we didn't hear any more of those stories. But he, he really was a great bloke. Got on so well, just chatted away. Especially when I came back onto the series for the, as a paramedic, we're just talking about football, Chelsea and West Ham. And uh, no, happy days. My favourite storyline would have to be, I mean, the piano was great fun. But on a real personal level, it was the burger van scene. A, I'm driving somebody else's, one of the actual firemen we used to have around on set, the BMW that Les drove in it was his personal BMW. It was an automatic and he was quite happy to let me drive it. And I'd driven an automatic before, but didn't crash it, so it worked. And for me, what I loved about that was I really got a chance to use some gentle menace. And it was also a shot. Being a big Spaghetti Western fan when I grew up, watching Once Upon a Time in the West with the opening sequence with Charles Bronson's face filling the screen and not doing anything. It became like a bucket list, holy grail shot to have. So when we're setting up on this, when I'm going to deliver the menaces to George, the crew went, right, we're going to set you up for your BFCU. Oh, what's that? He said, oh, it's a technical term. Stands for big fucking close up. I thought, oh. So they shoved the camera in. I get to do the scene. Cut. And then I heard the crew go. Whew. And I thought, yes. They're professionals. They've seen it done a hundred times times but if you've managed to do something in the moment where they've held their breath and relaxed afterwards because it's tense yeah so that episode jumping out the in fact one effort one cut i jumped out the uh, bmw so quickly hit my head on the top i almost expected it to be on the uh the rap reel, the blooper reel that they show on the rap party didn't make it, but it was actually quite fun, especially when you push for time and it's like we are now going on over time. Yeah. That episode for personal reasons, that's one of my favorites. I picked up a new agent last year, Richard Court Management. He was a year above me at college. So he knows what it's like to be my age and to be in the business. I do stuff. Bits and bobs comes my way now and again, and I'm hoping now to break back into it. Now that I've got this agent and we've passed Touchwood lockdowns and back to passports and whatever. Um, I've got a part-time job in a supermarket brings money in i get to talk to people i get to entertain and it keeps it real because if i can make you laugh when you're buying a pack of cigarettes if i can keep you laughing you're putting when i can do the countdown for you to tap your card because the machine's so bloody slow then that's what it's about if i'm okay if i'm not on the telly if i'm not in a film i'm not in the theater I'm still doing the basics and that is communicating, which ultimately I think is the important thing for me, which is why doing this, it's great. It's a chance to, yeah, I did this professionally and I still do it professionally. So thank you very much for this opportunity. <laughs>